Awesome. Well, thank you, Jackie. Uh, welcome, everyone. I apologize while I'm speaking. Um, I'll just apologize in advance. I'm in the uh, lovely Chicago Midway Airport heading back home. So um, Jackie's going to take over the, the second half of the call, and I'll, I'll start the first half. So uh, welcome, everybody, to MVP Office Hours. Uh, my name is Jared Kingston, uh, one of the MVPs, and uh, excited to uh, kick this off with you today. So uh, for those of you who have not been on MVP Office Hours before, uh, or those that have, just a refresher, um, it's an open discussion. So, you know, uh, as you see there, you know, no, no dumb questions, no bad questions. Um, uh, we are here to help you. Um, and we are recording the call. So uh, we'll record it and post it uh, so that you can go back and, you know, use it as your weekend entertainment, whatever you may like. Um, and we'll post that out uh, on the MVP Office Hours Twitter as well as the Success Community. And uh, because this is an open dialogue, um, uh, all we ask is that you mute your line um, so that, uh, for instance, you don't hear uh, lovely uh, airplane uh, or air announcers announcing boarding times. So, um, and then to ask questions, uh, you can raise your hand in the web meeting uh, or you can post in the chat and we'll – uh, we'll moderate, um, you know, kind of as they come in, kind of a first come, first serve. And, uh, and then obviously if there's, you know, a, a dead, dead period, uh, feel free to speak up as well. Um, we'll take those. All right. Uh, just, uh, you know, a reminder here, we, we posted this out, but, uh, you know, we have been doing every other Friday, but we wanted to give you a more formal uh, uh, way to mark your calendars for MVP office hours. Um, so it's the first and third Friday of every month, uh, and it will be at this same time, uh, 11 a.m. Pacific, uh, 1 p.m. Central, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern, um, each, each of those days. So uh, mark your calendars, uh, join us, and uh, uh, we would love to have you. So the, uh, um, from a success community standpoint, um, we have the group out there, so definitely, you know, sometimes – you, you may ask a question where they really need to see a screenshot or uh, more information. Uh, you post post those there in the group, and, and we'll be uh, looking for those after the call. Um, as things come up during the week, uh, we recommend that your best place is to is to post those within the answers community. Um, and then, uh, if you want to cross post, you know what you posted there in the group. Totally cool. Um, and uh, yeah, so next slide. All right. Uh, Can you see that, Jared? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a reminder here this is, you know, uh, the uh, MVP Office Hours Twitter handle. Go follow that. We'll, we'll tweet out, uh, you know, registration, to, you know, uh, as well as special guest information and the uh, recordings there and any updates, you know, whether it's events that, that we're going to be at, uh, et cetera. So. A um, couple events coming up that we want to remind you guys of, uh, Midwest Dreaming, uh, where I'm um, at currently um, in July in Chicago. Uh, definitely sign up for that. Um, and uh, Force Landia, uh, which I think is an uh, awesome name, uh, and July 28th. So you can go to Chicago um, and then just fly to Portland from there. Uh, then uh, World Tours, um, Chicago is one that's coming up next week. Um, I personally will be there, I know, as well as a lot of other MVPs. Um, uh, beef, if you're going, um, uh, keep an eye out on the MVP Office Hours Twitter handle. Um, I'll be there with some cool laptop stickers as well as um, some uh, business cards to uh, uh, keep your uh, keep handy for the event um, or for MVP Office Hours. So be on the lookout for an announcement of you know, where to uh, to meet to get those. Um, and then obviously Dreamforce um, in October. Um, for the two events at the top, just to note there that uh, you can check the, out the community for registration and details. 
And, uh, you know, again, we're, you know, today is uh, another one where we're uh, uh, kicking off with a special guest and uh, we're, we're, we're doing this more and more. Um, so we're just trying to find common themes where we can, you know, bring in some uh, people who are really experts in that area and have had a lot of experience. Um, and uh, these MVPs who have been ingrained uh, in those areas to really help uh, help those questions. So definitely keep submitting those topics and those questions on the group to us to uh, let us know where we can uh, continue to bring in people for. All right, and for today's special guest, we have uh, the one and only Dan Appleman. Um, he, he told us, I don't know why you guys are making a big deal about us, but yeah, I think he's kind of a big deal. Um, uh, you know, he's, he's authored a book. I, I personally never authored a book, at least uh, at least since like uh, grade school or middle school. I forget which one it was. Um, so, uh, author of Advanced Apex Programming, uh, uh, Salesforce MVP, and a CTO, and an ISV partner. So, uh, a lot of experience uh, around uh, platform development and um, especially around the Apex language and design patterns. So we're excited to have Dan on, and hopefully you prepared your questions uh, for him, and uh, excited to, uh, to get going here. So with that, I don't think we have anything else. I think we're ready to go. Dan, are you ready? I am ready. Okay, so um, before we get going here with Dan, we have other MVPs on the call who also have expertise um, uh, to provide. So uh, for those MVPs, um, if you could just raise your hand in the meeting so I don't miss you, but uh, uh, we'll go down the line and just uh, as an MVP, you know, give us your name, how long you've been using Salesforce, your area of expertise, um, if you had to dwindle it down to one, and then just one you know, quick tip of, uh, from your arsenal of knowledge. So. Um, I know he hasn't raised his hand, uh, but his name starts with a B, and I'll start with him. Uh, Mr. Gross, do you want to go first? Sure, I'll go first. Uh, my name is Brad Gross. I have been doing Salesforce since 2000. Uh, my area of expertise, um, creating lots of havoc and, and carnage in the Salesforce <laughs> organization. So I'm pretty good at that. Um, a tip for my arsenal of knowledge. I actually deliver a, a presentation on this fairly often, and I always say, the, don't create until you have a plan. So that would be the most important thing possible when you do sales work since there are so many switches that can be pulled. Awesome. Thanks, Brad. Um, let's go to um, David Ching. I'm, <coughs> excuse me. I'm David. Oops. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, hi, I'm David Chang. I'm uh, uh, developer with uh, Idealist Consulting. I've been using Salesforce since about 2006, um, and my area of expertise, main area, is um, Apex and Visual Force. And I guess a quick tip is um, I really like the Salesforce Navigator uh, ex uh, Chrome extension. Very nice tool for getting to um, areas of the setup menu very quickly. And that's it. Awesome. Thanks, David. Let's go to uh Kelly, let's go to uh, Kelly. Oh, and, and whoever's <laughs> yeah, yeah, whoever's uh, doing the old punch yeah. the keys, Jamal. Yeah, can you uh, go on mute? I think they're just trying to give me a, a soundtrack that I'm just running while I'm doing all these great uh, Salesforce tasks. Um, my name's Kelly Benchibo. I've been working with Salesforce since 2007. Um, I'm just getting started with uh, Apex development, so I would say my experience is more centered around advanced administration with, uh, with formulas. And the tip I would give, um, you're going to want to do this, but never, never overwrite an old user. There are a lot of implications with security and permission sets when you do that, uh, not to mention if you're utilizing chatter. So you'll want to do it and be lazy, but do not do that. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks, Kelly. Let's go to a new freshly minted MVP, Christy. Hi. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, my name is Christy Guzman. I've been using Salesforce for about 10 years. 
I would say I'm also in that um, awesome admin, advanced admin area. Um, and on a somewhat user-related note, I will say I've been in my job about a week, and one of the first apps I installed was Clone This User so that I can um, still have a lot to learn about profiles and who's who, but that way I can just clone someone similar as I start to uh, delve into changing those profiles so I can easily add someone without missing a permission set or some other setting that they might need for their role. Awesome. Thanks, Christy. Um, let's go to uh, James. Yeah, hello. Uh, James Lothar here. I'm an architect with uh, Domain Chain Systems. I've been developing on Salesforce for, I don't know, six or seven years or so. Um, specialty revolves around uh, APEC and visual force and integrations. Um, so uh, one tip, um, that's, that's a tough one, but uh, I've been diving into lighting components and if you're a developer and haven't started learning about lighting components yet, I'd suggest pursuing that path. Pretty cool stuff. Awesome. Yeah, great tip. Yeah, great tip. Uh, all right, well, let's go to, I think the last person here is Steve. Steve, are you out there? Oh, hey, how's it going? Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, sorry, I was on, uh, I was on mute. Uh, my name is Steve Molas, or Steve Mo. I've uh, been an uh, admin developer here since 2003, so I'm, I don't, I'm not quite as old in dog years as Brad is, but um, uh, if I have an area of expertise, probably um, formulas, um, you know, formula fields, validation rules, workflow rules, and uh, old school analytics, not, uh, not wave or anything funky like that, but classic reports and dashboards. I like it. Old school. <laughs> All right. Emphasis, <laughs> emphasis, on, emphasis on the old, minimize on the, on the school. <laughs> uh, awesome. And then... Uh, Last but certainly not least, uh, Jackie. Thank you, Jared. This is Jackie Trevieso out of South Carolina, and my area of expertise or where I spend all my time is in the sales cloud. And I'd say my one tip in my arsenal of knowledge is as people are asking you to build things, really get them to talk about the whys and less about the hows. So what are they going to use the information for? Is it actionable? Are they going to make business decisions based on that, or is it just a nice to have? because you really want to make sure that you are filling your page layouts with things that you can utilize to make business decisions. So that's my tip. Awesome. And uh, any other MVPs that I may have missed there? Okay, awesome. Um, and I just realized I didn't really introduce myself. I'm, I'm Jared Kingston. Um, I've been using Salesforce for uh, about seven years now, mainly in kind of an admin consultant role. Um, one, uh, you know, one tip I, I would say if there's something I've learned is, just, you know, and it's kind of stealing it from Brad, um, but, uh, you know, kind of leading, you know, with some sort of strategy of why you're doing what you're doing um, always helps guide um, your, your development. So with that being said, um, what? Oh, wait, Jared, Jennifer, support. sorry. Yes, thank you. Sorry, sorry, Jennifer. I'm just learning some of the new MVP names, and I totally apologize. So go ahead, Jennifer. Uh, not a problem. My name's uh, Jenny Bennett, and I've been using Salesforce for a little over four years now. Um, I think my area of expertise would probably be learning. <laughs> I don't know if that's a expertise, but I'd like to, to um, learn all things Salesforce. And then, um, so I guess my one tip would be to never stop learning and and keep challenging yourself. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So I think we're good. Uh, so as you can see, for those of you on the call, we have a lot of brain power. Um, so with that being said, who would like to kick us off with the first question? There's no being shy on the call. Hi, I 
have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Hi, this is uh, Jessica. Um, I have a question concerning contacts. We we do a lot of maintenance with our contacts, and we haven't turned on the duplicate contact feature. Uh, we tried to turn it on one time, and we had some custom-made uh, programs within our Salesforce org that it just caused a whole bunch of issues and was kicking things out and messing up, I guess, Visual Force pages that I don't know how to fix. We had somebody else uh, go in and create those. So we turned it off. But our problem with contacts is uh, basically I'm trying to clean them up. What we've been doing is um, we, when a contact is no longer with an account, instead of just, you know, we don't want to delete the contacts, we have one of them on historical for cases and so forth. But we've been moving them over to just a, like a temporary account, like a non-member, non-account account that we just built. And we've been moving them, you know, just linking them to that other account. Uh, we did create an inactive contact checkbox, and that's been there for years since the original um, Salesforce admin came on, or I guess whenever we first got onto Salesforce. But is there, um, so now we're requesting, um, requesting a bunch of um, issues, and it just seems like it takes a lot of time to move all those contacts over, and it just seems silly to me. So is there a better way to, you know, maintain those, you know, contacts that we're not using, but without having to move them around? Is there a way to not see them maybe, or I, I just want to see how, what are some ideas? So the first question I would ask, um, unless I missed uh, you having said it, was why do you want to keep those contacts if they're not something that you're you're utilizing? Because we want to keep the historical um, significance within the cases and our return uh, returns objects and, and some other custom objects we have. So it things. sounds like those contacts, it would be very relative uh, or pertinent for you and your users to understand that those contacts were associated with a specific contact, a specific account at some point in time, historically, correct? That's what I was thinking, yes. So, so rather than moving them to an inactive account and kind of clustering them all together and losing that relationship, um, you could put some kind of a status on, uh, you, I think you said you have an inactive checkbox, so somebody's going to have to actually manually check that. And then you can also display that in your related list on the account. So when you scroll down on account um, and it's got the contacts, you can display that so that at a quick glance you can see that those are historical contacts. They're no longer valid, but just in case you need the information, here it is. Is that the piece that you think you're missing? Right. I'm trying to just think of a way that they're just so you, the users are – uh, so you, we've gone through a couple of admins, and we're just the users are so used to not having them there, you know, they don't want to even see them associated with the account. And I don't know if there's a way without actually having to move them, if you know, there's just a way not to see them anymore. So if your users don't want to see them, who you needs to have that them. historical information? Oh, I would say maybe just like one or two people would, you know, whoever wants to go back and research it, and that's probably like the directors. Uh, director of customer service and maybe the returns you, person. It, this is uh, this is Steve. Um, can, you, can you hear me? Yes. Um, what is your org wide default sharing setting on contacts right now? Uh, it's public rewrite. Public rewrite. What you could do is make it. You know, create a custom checkbox field if you haven't already, like called archive or something like that, and set the um, contact um, access to private, and then create a sharing rule, a criteria-based sharing rule, and the criteria would be the archive checkbox is unchecked. And create a rule that basically says, all right, if it's an un if it's if it's not an archive contact then every role can see it. Every role and every role subordinate can see it. Now, if I do that for contacts, well, isn't that tied in with accounts? Uh, I think they've loosened it up. I think that, um, uh, let me think, because I know that contacts have their own level of sharing. There's controlled by parent. But there's also private, public read only, public read write. Okay. Um, 
you know, I because our accounts you know, are you like, know public rewrite right now as well. Yeah. So I, I want to add one comment. Uh, yeah. I think uh, you can get really good guidance from our admin experts in terms of how best to do it from a usability perspective. But I can tell you from a technical perspective, putting uh, contacts on accounts on a temporary account like that is really, really bad. Um, it creates account data scheme, which can significantly impact the uh, performance of your org, and you can start getting uh, all kinds of record locking issues uh, as well. So uh, whatever you do, choose any solution other <laughs> than assigning the contacts to a temporary account. So everything that we're doing, anything else but what we're doing now. Yeah, if you want to look into it more, uh, just Google Salesforce account data skew, and you'll see some articles that talk about technically why that particular solution is really, really bad. Okay, all right, I will do that. Thank you. I think that we might be, um, we're, we're basically, we have two companies, uh, sister companies sharing an org right now because we share con uh, customers, and only one company is like maintaining all of the contacts for both companies. And at this point, we might be bringing in another we, a sister company into our org. And if we do that, we might have to change our accounts to private. So if we're going to remove them completely, I think that might be a good time to put in that, what Steve was talking about, that, well, that um, checkbox. See, don't see it. Yeah, it, and this, this is Steve again. Uh, don't quote me on that because th this is probably one of my weaker – points as far as you know uh, it, it it in 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 theory it sounds like it would work and it seems like it would work but i would want to you know play around with this in uh in your sand sandbox or in a dev org okay that's no problem so um i'll do the i think i'm you know the first suggestion where we can move it in and just make the inactive box visible and then if we go to change our when we go to change our model or our, our you know, or by defaults, then try to work that second suggestion in. But I'll let them know that it's been advised that we not continue to move them over. <laughs> so thank you all very much. I appreciate it. And Jessica, I'm posting a link that uh, Christy Guzman just shared with us. Um, well, actually, that didn't work. I'll be posting that link here in just a second so that um, she's got some information here about data skew itself. Great. Thank you. So that will be posted here. Thanks, Christy. And Brad has uh, so guys, Yeah, so uh, guys, I have, uh, so on top of Christy's question, I've got a, you know, a little, uh, little, little clarity here. So, uh, let, so let's say we we'll keep on uh, accumulating these contacts and these words in our, now, so obviously, you know, we don't want to assign them to a particular uh, account or a user in order to, you know, get away from the data issue. But let's say we keep on letting them, okay, we hide them using that in, in, in active checkbox or make OWD is private. But, you know, there, there will come a time where we can hit, uh, you know, sandbox or you know, the or storage limits. Uh, so in that scenario, is it as advised that we just, you know, for forever and ever, we keep the cause in Salesforce and uh, inside our production org, or is there any some solution to this problem? Uh, you know, it's advised that we move all these things out uh, kind of an Excel sheet and name them. So I'm, I'm, so, you know, a bit bit of a long-term solution and also, you know, avoiding hitting the data storage limit. So is it, is it like, you know, just keep on our Salesforce to increase the data storage? So how is it going to work? from the long silence that it was breaking up for other people and not just me. Yeah, so I tell you're breaking up a little bit. I was hoping that that was just on my end, but it looks like uh, it was maybe everybody. Um, that, might I suggest since that was All right, a okay. specific question, um, would you put that in, in the uh, success community so that um, – we can all take a look at that and really get you the answer that you were needed because that seemed, sounded really in depth. Got it. Oops. So okay. I'll, uh, let me put that in chat. Just, it's, just, it's just a one-line question. That's it. Okay. 
okay, yeah, put it in chat and then I'll, I'll read it out to everybody. And then in the meantime, uh, we've got a question that came in from Cal. I'm not sure if Jared is still with us or not, but um, uh, his question is for Dan. And it says, with his queuable pattern in Ed 3 of his book, if doing asynchronous inserts and updates of records on multiple objects, would you recommend a single queuable class that handles all records from created from the custom object you write um, that you write them as in a pattern as in the pattern you proposed? Pattern is where records are written to customer or custom objects from triggers then processed from queuable. Or would you recommend a separate queuable for each type of record? And I have, to be honest with you, I have no idea what I just read, so Dan, go for it. Uh, I don't know that there's so any forward, yeah. particular okay. right or wrong answer to that one. Box here. Um, <coughs> you, what you're doing it's when a, you're, when you're cheap, doing cheer way of getting Jessica, there. can you mute yourself? Okay, you're, go ahead, you're Dan. Partitioning, uh, you're sort of choosing between the number of asynchronous calls that are occurring and how much you can get done in each one. And the balance is you sort of want to do as, as much as you can in any particular queuable call because you don't necessarily want to be burning off the number of asynchronous operations you can have in an org, especially if it's a, a, a very busy org. Uh, I would tend to have a preference to use one queuable class. In fact, in our product, we did one queuable class, and it delegates uh, to the different object types. But th I, I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with using multiple queuable classes, one for each different custom object, uh, especially if you don't have a huge number of them. But there's no right or wrong answer. You're just sort of balancing uh, the load on the system. Cal, does that answer you your question? A, if you have 100 custom classes, I would not do 100 queuable instances if you have a, a lot going on. Uh, you know, the nice thing about having a, a different queuable class for each custom object is it's easier to figure out what's going on in the system. You know, you can actually look in the Apex job log and you can actually see which ones are being processed. Yeah, it's sort of a gray area. Okay, so our next question, a tool has put it in the, um, okay, Cal says, thank you. I used one and had it uh, to handle four types. So that looks good. So a tool's question, he says, any long-term solution to accumulation of records in Salesforce, or is it that we need to ask Salesforce to keep on increasing data limits in Salesforce? What is the long-term solution to this? Accumulating data as in an opportunity to, for Salesforce to sell you more data space? I, I don't think they have any objection to that. It kind of sounds or, like he's looking for, for data management recommendations. Any long-term solution to accumulation of records in Salesforce or is that we need to ask Salesforce to keep on increasing the data limits? If he means storage limits, then uh, the long the solution is you delete data you don't need. I mean, I'm, I'm again, I'm not an admin, so I don't know how the various uh, being an admin MVP would be better to answer the question of how to to deal with uh, storage management issues uh, on a particular org. Brad's got a comment. Brad, I muted you. I'm always got a comment. So let me, all right, thanks. So my, my, my question to him would be, what are you trying to gain from having the data continually stay inside of Salesforce versus, you know, if, if, if it's power reports and dashboards or reports some sort of decision-making process going forward, does it make sense to store every single record or does it make sense to store um, uh, aggregate data instead. That's question one. Question two is how long do you really need to store 
the individual records? Like, is there a shelf life to these things? And if there's not, then you, then you start talking about doing aggregation. And then step three is, you know, there are ways now, and Salesforce will keep working on it to uh, create remote. It's it's not remote objects because that's not that's not the correct that's not the correct term for it. But basically, creating other database sources that are not inside of Salesforce, but yet Salesforce can talk to it. There are there, those things are still coming, so it's it's a good thing to start to consider. But uh, we have this problem a lot with our clients where they want to store everything under the sun, including marketing messages. And you start to have to start. You start having this conversation of what's called line noise, where you have so much information, you have so many things happening on a record that you cannot separate what's truly important versus what is actionable and what is what is as good to know. So it's a, it's a and it's different for every word. But it's a very. Thank you, Brad. So uh, next up is Squire. Hey everybody. Um, so kind of it seems like we're wasting Dan's time because there's a lot of data <laughs> uh, questions here. But um, similar question to what we've been talking about. Uh, has anybody dealt with as far as the best practice? Uh, what to do with legacy campaign member records? We've got an org that is about a year old. We have maybe just under 600,000 what I'll call actual records, and we're pushing 10 million campaign member records already based on the amount of output we do. We're not really sure what we should be doing with that legacy uh, member detail, if there's if there's a best practice or a recommendation or if anybody's dealt with that situation. How many of them are uh, responses versus non-responses, like the responded? Um, so we don't track response at all. What it really comes down to is knowing that a deliver deliverable of a, a message was given. We're in a final services org, and so very often what they really want to know is we sent the deal announcement or we sent the, the, um, the quarter letter res relating to their fund details uh, over time. So I mean, it feels to me a little bit like tasks, but then that gets even more ch of a challenge. So that's kind of where we're at. So, oddly, and first of all, I just want to comment that it's not a waste of time even hearing other people because I learn stuff, but uh, because my company happens to be in the marketing analytics business, we live with campaign members all the time, So, uh, but mostly responses, uh, which is a little different from what you're saying. Uh, what I would look at considering is, uh, and other people might have much better answers to this, but to think about why you're why you might need that data, what kind of information you want to gain from it, and look at potentially, um, you know, writing an application or, or so on to sort of aggregate that data. For example, um, you know, track, create a custom object or something and track campaign statistics so that you have, you can still keep the core information that you're trying to keep track of on a historical basis but you're not necessarily keeping all the raw data to generate it. So that's an approach you might consider. Yeah, I like that. I mean, effectively archiving it by turning it into a different data type and then and having something that's a little bit more manageable over time. Yeah, for example, one of the things we do is uh, we uh, have a, uh, a custom object where we uh, store uh, actually campaign member data but we divide it by day. So every day we keep a record of what happened you know, on one custom object, sort of what are the aggregate data for that day. And that allows us to do date-based reporting, but also you, know, you can generate all kinds of other information, totals and so on over various periods of time. Um, we have the information we need, but we don't need the raw data anymore if you do it that way. All right, thank you very much. Thank you for your question, Squire. Next up, we have Adam. Adam, I see you posted it in chat, but if you have um, voice access, you're welcome to, to ask. Hey, what's up, everybody? Um, thanks for the help. So I'm really struggling with attempting to use collaborative forecasting to uh, report on schedule amounts and quotas as well, and quotas that can span multiple periods, of course. So I understand that uh, collaborative forecasting, according to the documentation, it's not supposed to work with schedules. However, I did uh, find a report type. It's not supposed to exist, but it's called 
split opportunities with products and schedules. And in terms of reporting on users that are contributing to opportunities and, and how they are you know, going to get credited for the um, schedule period, it works pretty well. My struggle is when we, we attempt to bring in quotas into this, and I wasn't having any luck with the native quota functionality, so I started building some custom objects for quotas. And you know, before I get too far, well, all right, let's face it, I'm really far down that rabbit hole, but uh, I'm hoping that somebody else has, uh, has found a better way. Anyone have any thoughts? Steve Moore, are you still on the line? So you Hi there. stumped everyone here. <laughs> well, that's good. I mean, it wouldn't bring yeah, the easy I, ones uh, here. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, splits are something I've never had. I haven't had a lot of experience with. Um, um, yeah, I'm, hey, Steve, I'm kind of stumped. Um, yep. So, uh, how, do I, how do I say this nicely? So let me ask, let me ask a really stupid <laughs> question about the report. Is, okay. your, is that report for forecasting, is it pulling in from the opportunity split? Okay. Or is it pulling from the opportunity amount? And number, it would number one, number two is when you start to combine up against the forecast, what are you seeing? Are you seeing the split amount? Uh, that's correct, yes. Yeah. So it's pulling from the opportunity split. And um, yeah, I, I think that answers the, both questions. And, uh, yeah. Okay. So, so the. Quotas are quotas are a pill. I mean, I'll be the first yep. one to admit it. Quotas are just an absolute pill with standard Salesforce. So, yep. um, especially when they cross periods, because Salesforce doesn't like that at all. No, they you don't. Typically, have to break it down into its lowest common denominator to make it work even close. No. Yep. So, I wish I could give you better. I wish I could give you better better answer, except to say that number one, quotas need to go down to the lowest common denominator for a period. That's that's issue one. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's probably not which how your business wants to run either. So that's going to be that'll be exciting. Okay. And then in terms of if you try, and I'm just I'm, I'm spitballing here, but have you tried creating a custom report type that combines that data? Um, I don't think I've actually gotten there yet. You know, I'm still experimenting with like the metadata and just how I want, you know, how to get everything where I need it. You know, so right the, at the moment, I have a custom quota object, and you know, I was talking to my success manager, and she went, you know, deep internally, and uh, they, somebody put a, a, a custom currency field on the opportunity split object for every quarter, quota quarter. I hate saying the, that phrase, but using a lot these these past few weeks. So that for every, so there's four custom objects on split now. Q1 quota. Quota Q1, quota Q1, quota 2, and so I, forth. I, and I'm gonna, I, good. And I was just going to populate, I was going to link the split record to the individual quota uh, custom object record, which would be tied to a user and have you know, a quota for each quarter directly on there. In fact, I was going to use role of summaries and then try to make it a little bit more dynamic that way. So I, I guess, I'm sure it's hard to envision, but, uh, but I feel like I might see a light at the end of the tunnel here. Uh, uh, this is Steve. I, I'm, I'm posting a link in the chat. This just, you know, uh, you know, it's just something I built a long, long time ago. Um, it might be a workaround. It might be a starting point that you could use for something that you build yourself. Uh, or it might be nothing. Um, but, uh, what I did is, and I'm sorry, I'm trying to multitask here, uh, caught me in pasting and typing. Um, what I did is I used the standard opportunity object, mm -hmm. and using record types, I created uh, basically 
a quota opportunity, and because it's built off the same object opportunity, you can compare sales opportunities to quota opportunities side by side using standard, basically any standard off the shelf opportunity report. Opportunities with products, opportunities with with products and revenue uh. schedules, and I'm uh, and I'm going to guess that it's price. It will probably work with a split report too. And the nice thing is, you know, uh, um, you you can use you know uh, you can use record you can use, because you get using record types. You can then have like a completely different page layout for what a quota opportunity looks like. You can strip it down to the bare bones, like right. uh, the. I mean, uh, one of the reasons why I went down this road is because I had a requirement that um, for, say, a BDM, you know, they're not in charge of a particular account. They're not in charge of a particular product line. They have just a number they've got to hit. So that quota, it can't be really tied to an account. It's just a dollar amount that's due to fall within a certain period, and it's, a, and it's attached to that BDM. So I actually, on the quota layout, made account name optional. Right. But so that if somebody is an account manager and they have a, a number they're supposed to hit for an account, the sales operations person, they can take that person's quota and they can attach it to the account that that account manager is in charge of. Likewise, hmm. you might have a pro, likewise you might have a product manager. So then they're not bound by an account but they're bound by a product line and they have a number they're supposed to make for a specific product. You create a, a quota opportunity, you don't attach it to an account, you assign it to the, to the product manager, and you attach products to it and assign revenue and even schedule that revenue out by product. Okay. Oh, that's very interesting. So you just, just have you, like, you a, just, like a, quote, like yeah, a ghost and, opportunity and of, with just the total and, quota amounts. Yeah. And because it's record type, you can control who has the ability to create a quota. You probably don't right. want people creating their own quotas. You probably want somebody in management creating creating the quota and assigning it to the, the people. Hmm, that's really, that's just, just really interesting. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's giving me a couple of ideas. If there is a link posted, I, I can only see I can only see chat with presenters. So I don't know if, okay. if the moderator can just uh, pass that over to me. It's in oh. the slides. I just dropped it in there. So. Oh, oh, that one's for me. Okay, where it says tips and tricks. And, and, yes, sir. And, and no no offense taken if you look at it and you're like, nah, not going to work for us. Uh, well, you I know, can't click um, the link, so that's going to be, <laughs> that's gonna be uh, an issue, but uh, maybe I'll type it in. Yeah. You should be able to search um, creating sales. Um, oh, okay, search, great. Search the, the name of it. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, no offense taken if it's not going to be a solution for you. No, I just I, I appreciate. Um, I'm looking for ideas. I know this is not yeah, an I'm, easy <laughs> thing. So yeah, it, you came you came to the right place. I'm, but you know, I'm like Leonardo da Vinci. My head is filled with ideas. Unfortunately, <laughs> most of, unfortunately most of them are as useless as a wooden helicopter powered by ropes and pulleys. Ah, uh, we're gonna we're gonna see your brain in a museum one day. I know it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, great. Well, I found that link, and uh, and I'll check it out. Thanks, everybody, for your time. Thank you. That's some good good discussion. It looks like Brad, you've got a question here in the chat. It says, "Can you ask Dan about what his thoughts are between writing immediate triggers versus using scheduled Apex to process data?" Well. Depends on what kind of processing you're trying to do. For example, if it's uh, relatively simple and if you want to update uh, a field on the object, then a before trigger is a very nice way to go. You don't have any extra DML and, and so on. Uh, I think there are a lot of things that make sense to do in triggers. Um, scheduled uh, is you know, anything asynchronous. It has to be something that you don't really care when it gets done because you don't know how long it's going to take. Uh, the big advantage of anything asynchronous or scheduled is that uh, you have much higher limits to work with. Uh, you have less risk of uh, interacting with other things because you own the execution context. You're the entry point of the execution context. So 
you know, you sort of have at least some level of control over what's going on within that context as compared to a trigger where you have no idea what other things brought that trigger about and how you got to that point. So it really depends on what you're trying to do. Brad, did you have any other? Oh, he says thumbs up. So it looks like he's good. Thank you, Dan. Anyone else have questions? We've got about 16 minutes left on our time together today. We have a question from Sona. Is there a way to create custom report which includes campaign and lead activities? Is there a way to create custom reports which includes campaign and lead activities? That sounds like a little more of, a, of an admin thing. And I'd have to physically go in and do it and see if we could do that. Or campaign with op opportunity activities. She's asking. Or, or he's asking. Wait, let me ask a different question. So are we talking about all campaigns? So how inclusive are we talking about? So if you're a member of a lead, if, you're, if, you're, if your lead is a part of a campaign, you want to I think we lost you, Brad. All right. Yeah, let me try this again. So my question was, are you trying to see if a lead is part of a campaign? Are you trying to see the activity data for both that lead and that? So we're getting a response. The lead is part of campaign for one particular campaign, and then the activities on that lead. So Mike, so then the next question is, you want to see it as part of the campaign. So you're running a report on campaign members, and you want to see all if it's going to do that. Um, just so happens I'm in Salesforce. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. This is Steve. I, I think you might be packing your bags for the wonderful world of uh, joint reports. So now are you familiar with uh, joined reports? Jennifer agrees with Steve on joined reports. Sona wants to know, would that work on a dashboard? So I believe you have to just build that out, and then the data points that are, are in your, uh, your joined report should be available to you in a dashboard, depending on what you're grouping on and what you're trying to achieve. All right, we got a cool. Thank you. I think we've uh, sent Sona down the right path. Anyone else have a question? Squire, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, just really quick for Dan, uh, I read uh, the second edition version of his book when I first got it, didn't understand any of it, and I've spent the last couple of years trying to understand it. And now I see there's a third edition, and I'm sure that there's a fourth coming. How, how many things have changed since you wrote the second edition, or even the third, that you are already thinking, I have to update this, or I have to make these sorts of changes based on uh, Salesforce's growth? 
So that, that's, a, that's a really good question. Uh, generally speaking, I update if there's any, anything significant having to do with the platform, uh, as long as it's not like massive change, I, I just put it up on the website. Uh, sort of like every release, I do a quick review, and if there are any significant changes I put there, I'm a little late on this one, but there wasn't anything significant in this release. Uh, with the third edition, and what brings forth a new edition is uh, sort of a major change, uh, and that would be uh, something where a platform change has led to basically invalidating the best practices from the previous edition. So for example, uh, in the second edition, I think we went from script lines to CPU lines, uh, to CPU time, and that sort of changes the way you look at that particular limit. So that really called for a change. In this one, uh, the entire approach for what are best practices for asynchronous operations uh, significantly changed because we had queuable apex and suddenly we had some really superior design, change, uh, design patterns available to us. So that entire chapter had to be completely rewritten. Uh, plus, uh, there's a whole new chapter on uh, maintenance. Uh, which is a subject that has become near and dear to my heart uh, over the past year. So, you know, a new edition is driven both by uh, changes in the platform and by, you know, adding substantial new content. And, you know, one of the ways that um, <clears throat> I addressed the, the question of, well, you know, do I is it really worth updating, is uh, basically I offer what, what I call upgrade pricing to everybody because, you know, who knows who has the book. But if you go to advancedapex.com, you can actually find like a, a discount code for uh, a really low cost, uh, substantial discount on purchasing the book. So people who know about the book already, know about the website, will find that. Uh, and uh, the Kindle pricing I've kept really low. It's like under 10 bucks. Uh, so that's another way to get it. Uh, Get the, the new edition very inexpensively. And, and is there a, a significant update plan because of the lightning direction at all? Uh, not at this time, and that's because you know this book is about Apex programming. This is you know I'm very clear that this is an Apex book. I don't cover Visual Force, uh, and lightning is a great new technology. I'm very excited about it. Um, but it's not really Apex. So uh, it, you know, maybe one day I'll know enough to do an advanced <laughs> lightning book, but that day is not today. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. Thanks, Squire. And um, Atul and Sona, I just chatted to you links. Steve Moe gave us a link to what can't I do with joined reports. Um, it's also in our PowerPoint slides. So I sent those to you as well. Anyone else have questions? We've got about six minutes. Any other burning questions for Dan and the rest of the MVP group here? It's a safe place, people. You can ask anything you want, I promise. No such thing as a stupid question. Nope. I had a math professor once who, uh, whenever someone would ask her a so-called stupid question, people would laugh. He would immediately stop the class, and he would insist that everybody who did not know the answer to that question, should stand up and thank that person for asking it. And there would always be a lot of people, you know, who would be afraid to ask it themselves and who would at that point stand up and, and thank that person for asking the question. I love that. We have a question from, I hope I'm saying your name right, Sergey. What resources would you recommend to somebody starting with APEX? So, um, are you starting with Apex as in you've never programmed before? Are you starting with Apex as in coming in from a different programming language?
So almost never know. before is his response. So I love uh, David Liu's work on uh, sfdc99.com. Uh, he has a, a new course out on Pluralsight that is the sort of absolute beginners, uh, beginners apex. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I like that. A lot of people in Salesforce go from the admin to, uh, to apex course and they, they learn programming that way. And, uh, and that's good, but it's important to recognize that really developing software is, uh, you know, it is a, it's a pretty, it's a pretty big skill set. And I would encourage anybody who's really serious about it to also look at taking maybe at a community college or, or somewhere like, or online, a sort of beginning computer science course, uh, just general programming. Apex is a lot like Java. You know, all of these block structured languages are very similar. And what ends up happening in many cases, the people who are self-taught Apex, um, they, they are sort of learn how to do things using code, but they don't necessarily have a, a real in-depth understanding. There are usually some big gaping holes in, uh, in what they're learning. So, uh, you know, use, use SFDC 99. It really is a great resource. Uh, you know, look online, you'll see sample code and so on. But if you can, I really do encourage you to take a, a you know, sort of a entry level computer science course. You know, usually they use Java or something like that, just so that you sort of have that foundational knowledge that uh, I think can really take, help you learn faster and take you to the next level. We have two recommendations to add on to this, Dan. Jenny Bennett is suggesting Trailhead and Udacity as a good intro to programming. Uh, I, love, I love Trailhead. I consider Trailhead to be primarily curation as compared to training. It's, it's really more like the signposts of, of what to learn and where to learn it. Um, you know, and, and that is invaluable. Uh, uh, Udacity, I'm a big fan of Pluralsight because I'm an author there. Uh, if you get a Pluralsight subscription, they also have Code School, which is really, really cool beginning uh, programming, very interactive in a browser. So, uh, you know, uh, anything that's basically an introduction to programming or introduction to computer science uh, will give you a very nice uh, background that will be helpful with Apex as well. Great, those are some good resources. Squire says he learned a lot about web design and by the by visual Apex Java JS from treehouse.com. So those are some resources that you guys can all check out. Um, we are down to the wire. It is 2.59 my local time. Let me flip over here just one quick second. Um, it is no fool. April 1st, Mike Martin will be joining us um, as our uh, special guest along with a plethora of other MVPs. I'd like to just go ahead and wrap up this call and, and give a huge shout out and thank you to Dan Appleman for um, sharing his knowledge, especially around um, such the mystery that it is Apex um, and developing. Um, I think it was fantastic that we had a, a dedicated resource um, loved all of the questions that everyone had. Great participation. And um, hope to hear your voices on our next call. Remember, first and third Friday of the month. And um, everybody, have a great weekend. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreci appreciate you. And um, we will see you in the cloud, all. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Right. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Dan.